nice to meet up Vivian first time in Goa. First time we are meeting in no, Goa. No, no, no. First time in your house. In my house, yeah, but we met at uh, Goa Netters meeting. Yeah. So the last time I, me I remember meeting you was when uh, George Pinto was here and there were some girls from his cousins or someone from Aldona and that uh, Mickey, the musician. Yeah. Remember? He's, he's some relation of his. Mickey Korea. Mickey, Mickey Co Korea's granddaughter. Yeah, and Mickey Korea was there too. He was in a wheelchair. I see. Okay, okay, so that would have been quite some time back. But to get to get to the beginning, to start at the beginning, I first encountered you on Guanet. Right. This right. was in the mid to late 90s. Yeah, I was in the US at that time. And yeah, you were how old? Maybe in your 60s or 50s? I was or? Uh, late 50s. Wow. Late 50s. I retired at the age of 62. So first, give us the big picture. Give us a big picture, your migration, where all you've been, the jo okay. jobs you've done. I was born in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Okay? Hmm. And my friends growing up from very young were Rene Barreto, the Rene Barreto, yeah. and his younger brother, S.C. Barreto, who, uh, who was my classmate from kindergarten, and then suddenly disappeared from there. And my father retired at the age of 47 in 19, at the end of 1951 because his eyesight was failing. He had, he had got on disability on a small pension and he brought the family back to India. So we came to Goa and you know they, they couldn't, couldn't find a school. They put us in St. Paul's in St. Paul. That is a good school. That yeah. is a good school. So that's where I, I finished my high school. Yeah. And when I got to St. Paul's, I came across a whole bunch of folks from Dar es Salaam, including Rene and S.C. Barreto, I see. who had been there for about five years prior to me going there. Okay. Um, what happened? Nothing. It's okay. No problem. Carry on. Hmm? Fine. Come, come sit down. I was having that. See, I asked him if he wants. Yeah. Hmm? No. So anyway, um, so we came back to, uh, and you know, my father put us in St. Paul's boarding. He couldn't afford it on his small pension, and he decided to come and live in Belgium. So I grew up in Belgium from ninth, from early 1952 till 1958. I finished, I finished high school in Belgium. My father couldn't afford to send me to college. And uh, I used to give tuitions and try and pick up money by selling firewood and all kinds of stuff. Uh, walking up and down the streets. Life was tough in post-independence yeah, yeah, India. Yeah. my old, he, he, could, he could only afford to send one of us to college. So he sent my oldest brother, Edwin, who was Ruth's father. Okay sent him to college and he became a teacher and all that. So anyway, then I got a job in Bombay in 1958, September 1958, at a company called Cementation Company Limited, not the ACC Cement. Okay. Cementation was a construction company, a British construction company, near the Oval in yeah. Bombay. And I was staying, the only place I could get to stay was in Bandra, just opposite St. Stanislaus. I worked there for about seven months, tough, making 125 rupees a month. Which was not bad in that sense, but it was not good either. No, no, I was struggling, man. Okay. I, was, I had to pay for my pass to come, bus to get to the yeah, It's quite far, station, Bandra to Bandra, town, yeah. And, you know, we used to get our lunch by tiffin, 30 rupees a month for a, for a tiffin, I remember. And at night time, Oh, it, it was it was touch and go. Yeah. Very difficult, but still, I, I enjoyed Bombay. Though. Now, this really? was in the accounting field or tech field? It was in the drafting field. Okay. I had done uh, some elementary uh, drawing exam and second and uh, intermediate drawing exam in you know, the government. Yeah. And so I had some drawing skills, and I was helping them do. Simple layouts in the uh, the Singapore. I think at that time we were building a 
water pipeline from somewhere up north to go to Bombay. And I we see. had to build show the foundation and the piles for and I was used as a gopher by the by the company. Once they sent me to Basin. Yeah. To give something to somebody. And that time they sent me to the Durgapur steel project. Yeah. In West Bengal. West Bengal. Fire away. They wanted to fire the foreman. And they wanted to hand me to hand over a letter of termination. Okay. I didn't know what I was doing. Yeah. But I, and so I, I worked there for about seven months. I enjoyed it. Then I got news. Africa was over by then. There was no option of going back to Africa. No, for me, what yeah. happened when my father left Africa. Yeah. Although I was born there, I did not have the right to go back unless I went back with him. Okay. And he couldn't afford to go back. So I got stuck in India. And we appealed and, and we drew all kinds of appeals. We finally got a permit yeah. to go back to Africa in mid-1959. So I went to Africa. I, my first job was in the government. This is again Tanzania? The British, British uh, East Africa. East Africa. British, Tanganyika. Tanganyika. So then I, I, um, I got to, uh, what do you call it, uh, got a job in the government, entering inward letters. I didn't know what I was doing. Okay. But I, I, I found out later that when you write inward, you know, very boring job. Then I got a job in a bank, Barclays Bank. And Barclays Bank was... Full of guns? Full of guns. <laughs> they <laughs> called it the Goa Bank. I see. Lots of guns. At least over 80% over were guns. The account, chief accountant was a Goan, P.P. Mascarenas. And I, I, I enjoyed it. We had a lot of social life in the bank as well. You know, picnics, we went on trips to different places. Um, and then... Um, I got, I, the Tanganyika got independence. 62? December 9th, 1961. 61. Just nine days before Goa yeah. was liberated. So, in fact, I was there at the ceremony in the stadium when Prince Philip, um, you know, gave, brought the papers to give to the new Prime Minister of uh, Tanganyika who was Julius Nyerere. And at midnight, the lights went off and the British Union Jack was brought down and the Tanzanian flag went up. And I was in a crowd, I was, there were, you know, we were just three or four of us Indians, the rest yeah. of all Africans. Yeah. But everyone was so happy, we hugged each other and we were so happy, you know, about independence. And then, um, that was it. It was no longer Tanganyika. I mean, British. It was now now an independent country. But the governor who was there, the British governor, was proclaimed to be the governor general until they became fully independent, it became a republic. And I think it was a year later that they decided to let the British go away completely and became. Uh, Tanganyika. Uh, then there was, when it became Tanganyika, the Americans opened an embassy in in um, Dar. in Dar es Salaam, and I always wanted to go back to America. I had a lot of pen friends, and I wanted to go to America somehow. All I had was a high school SSC, 11th standard at that time, from the Pona board, and. Uh, no chance, no... No, no, qualifi no specialized qualifications. Nothing, nothing. Yeah. So I said, if I join the embassy, maybe I'll get closer to, to my goal. Yeah. And I joined the embassy. I was there as a um, accountant. I was making almost double what I was making in the bank. I see. And every year I got promoted. And I was promoted eventually to chief accountant of the embassy. They, they liked me very much. And I used, I used to fly between Dar es Salaam and Nairobi where we had a regional financial office for budget meetings or whatever. I used to go up and down all the time. And I used to go to Zanzibar, which was a consulate under us. 
to check on their accounts and the accounting staff there. Um, I enjoyed very much with the American, and they we had a great love relationship, you know, with them. Then my boss was after me. He said, Vivian, you got to get out of here. You, you get, you're Indians. The Africans will put you down. You must come to you must come to America. I said, How can I come? I don't have any qualification. No. In between what happened, there was a revolution on yeah. the island of Zanzibar. Remember? No. In no. December uh, 1963. Yeah. There was a revolution, and a few Goans were killed accidentally in the crossfire or whatever. But, and the Sultan of Zanzibar ran away, he had his private ship and he ran away. So there was a lot of turmoil, a lot of people were scared like hell. They didn't know what was, didn't going. Know what was going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think those Africans, when they got independent, they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't know how to run the country. Yeah. So they asked Julius Nyerere if they could join the mainland and became the Republic of United Republic of Tanganyika and Zanzibar. And then later on there was a, a competition to choose a new name. I see. And so they said Tan for Tanganyika and Zia for Zan, you know, yeah. Zania. Yeah, right. That's how it became Tanzania. And we were very happy there. As far as the Goans were concerned, we were happy. Nerere was more enlightened compared to other, some other he regional was, rulers. But he was still a socialist. Yeah, strong, okay. strong. He was a strong. He was a staunch Catholic. Yeah. He would be, we, you could meet him in church at 11 o'clock mass on Sundays. Which church? A Roman Catholic church, the St. Joseph's Cathedral. Okay. okay. He would be, he would be there, and he would he had a few security people, but he was very easy going. Yeah. He'd go and shake his hand and all that. Very very nice guy. And he had those sharpened teeth. You know, the, the uh, African some tribes used to sharpen their teeth into sharp... Really? Oh, yeah. He, his teeth were all, you know... I see. You know, like a... Yeah. Like a, a shark's teeth. Yeah. Know? That's how he looked. But he was a nice guy. Nice guy. He was apparently the only college graduate in Tanzania at that time. African college graduate. Yeah. He had done his master's from Edinburgh University in, um, in Scotland. Uh, Hall in uh, Scotland, yeah. And but he, but and he was a teacher in a Catholic school. And but but he was the most you know accomplished academically. And so he was a leader. And he was a nice guy. Yeah. But he had a socialist True. tendency. There was a guy in Salikan who was a good friend of his. You know Vincent Gomez. Uh, Vincent Machado. Yeah. Vincent Mach he made Vincent Machado the... Police chief? Yeah. So Vincent Machado is Gerard and uh, Desmond's father? No, no. Vincent Machado... At Grand Morot. Grand Morot, yeah. He had a brother hmm. named... Uh, he had a sister, Clara. His sons are Ge Des uh, Gerard and who are in Australia. Oh, those are his, his sons. Yeah. Okay, I don't know them. I don't know he them. He made him the police chief? Yeah. I mean, not the, the police okay. chief, but the second, like... I see. He was superintendent of police. I see. And there was a commissioner of police above. I see. But he was a superintendent. But uh, one of the things, he liked he liked Vincent very much. And Vincent was a smart guy, too. Vincent was a second generation Tanzanian. His father was born there. Okay. His father was born in Tanzania. And there were some Coderos also there, related to them, I don't know. Okay. It was a Basen Cordero. Basen Cordero, yeah, yeah, yeah. Venas, yeah. Venas, he had a brother called Venas yeah. who died years ago. Okay. But they were there. But uh, Vincent, I mean, nice guy. I, I went to see him shortly before he died. Unfortunately, he died. He passed away early, no? Yeah. Uh, last year sometime. Last year, okay. Yeah. okay. Anyway, and his father was a very, very good friend of my dad. His father and, and, and my father went to St. Xavier's High School together in Bombay. Okay. And they knew each other from, from youth. And when my father couldn't get a job, I mean, he, he got a job in Burma and lost it. And he didn't know what to do. And his friend told him, come to Africa. Paul in Machado. So my, my dad reached Africa. Wow. And then 
when you were in those in those days, when you joined, my father joined the government as a clerk. When you joined the government, they would give you rest and recuperation leave, long leave. Okay. Every four years, four you years. would get three four months, months four three months. to four months leave, depending on your grade. Okay. You know that. With the, with the passage by ship in those days yeah. to, to, the, to the sea and back. And um, so my, my dad went to Africa and then when he, when he decided to get married, he came back to, uh, to Goa and got married, took my mother back there to Africa and we were there for another, he got married in 36 and we, and we left in end of 51, about nearly 16 years and then we came back. I, I just completed the eight standard okay. there in, in, uh, in Dar es Salaam. Quite a tough age to change. Yeah, yeah, I had to learn Hindi. I had to learn from pounds, shillings and pence that we learned. I had to learn... Rupees and paisas uh, and annas. Uh, yeah, annas and all that. And then, uh, then we had to learn the geography we were learning was English geography. Tell, ask me about the Pennines and the and the Moors and everything else I could tell you because I still remember my English geography and history was of course about the British history. Yeah. Harold yeah. Awake and King Arthur and you know all that stuff. Yeah. Nothing to do with Africa, nothing to do with India. Right. So I had to study all over again. And then but prior to coming here, my mother was very sharp. She said I have to learn Hindi. And there was a uh, Temple, yeah, was by Hindu temple. Gujarati. Where they were giving, yeah, they were giving Hindi lessons free. I see. So she would come with me and sit with me while I learned the alphabet. Which is oh, tough, yeah. R E U, you know all that I learned in Africa. Okay. All the alphabet. When I came, at least I had the basics. Right. And I studied. I started in the eighth standard. I had to repeat the eighth standard when I came to Belgium. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so I finished one year behind what I would okay. have finished if I had been in Africa. I, was, I, was, I started school young, very young. So then we are in East Africa in the U.S. Embassy. How did the shift happen from there? Okay. How did it come from the from U.S. Embassy? Okay. There was, there was a revolution in Zanzibar, right? Yeah. I was, as, as a top accounting person, I had all the cash dollars, you know. I had to help all the American refugees that came. They were, they were pulled out immediately yeah. and brought to the mainland. I had to find a hotel room, I had to give each of them, I think it was $300 or something, spending money, yeah. get the signatures and all that stuff, and took care of all of them, and then arranged for them to be shipped back to, that was my job, okay. to ship them back to America to their home or whatever. And then from then after that, that was somebody else's responsibility. So that took place. A week later, there was a mutiny or a revolution in Dar es Salaam yeah. of the troops. The troops consisted only of about 1,500 soldiers, okay, the whole army. Yeah. And there was, a, there was an Indian guy who was a colonel, Colonel Kashmiri. And there was some Goans also working there, mostly in, uh, in the, whatever they call the quarter house, whatever they, you know, taking care of the stocks and so forth. But anyway, there was a revolution. I go to work, as usual. I was staying with two other bachelor friends of mine. And in town, Dar es Salaam, if you, if you were, somebody took you and put you in Dar es Salaam from here, you'd think you were in Bombay. The entire town was Indian. I see. Okay? And the club was very closely uh, close by. For us. We were all in walking distance. The church was walking distance. My work was walking distance. The whole town was Indian. You could hear Indian music. There were pawn shops here and mitai wallas here. I and see. Bajia, you know, all, all kinds of shops uh, in town. The Africans, you know, they couldn't afford the rent in town. So they were in the African area far I see. away. Mogomeni it was called. They were one side, and the British, they took over the Tony area, part of town, across, across a bridge near the, near the beach and all that. You know, they lived there. It was, segregation wasn't called segregation, but it was segregation. Yeah. And we were mixed with Goans. 
um, Aga Khan people. Ismailis. Ismaili. It Nashri, Shia it Nashri, which is a sect of okay. they were apparently one time they were also Ismaili or whatever. And then Daudi Bora and very few Sunnis. Okay. We all live together very very you know, nice. and a lot of Hindus. Gujarati. Gujaratis. Oh yeah. Diwali was a big thing <laughs> down there. And I remember, you know, when I was independent Tanzania got independence, I was going about with, with the kids. Pakistan, Zindabad, in Hindustan, Murdabad. I see. I, I didn't know what I was saying. Okay? I see. I was following them. The okay. next thing, some other guys are going, Hindustan, Zindabad, Pakistan, Murdabad. That also. <laughs> that was, I was, we didn't know. We yeah. were innocent. You know, yeah. We were going about. And I, I remember the Second World War, when this World War took place in 1945. We were told to come to the school with a mug. And we were each given some hot chocolate and two bluebird coffees to celebrate the victory. I see. When were, it got over. Yeah. And, the, and the, what call it, there were posters all over town like this, you know, V for victory. Okay. But it was like the hands of a German soldier. I see. You know. Yeah, raised in surrender. Raised in surrender. So anyway, when I was... Uh, no, no. How did I talk? I was talking about yeah. the American Embassy. Yeah. I got a job at the American Embassy. So when there was this revolution, I went to work as usual. I heard, I, we heard on on radio, that in Swahili, yeah, which I speak well, that there was something happening. I didn't know what it was. I walked over to the work to my job. I was. We were in a bank building, Standard Bank. We were on the fourth floor. Was the American Embassy. And it had a backyard. I used to come to the backyard where they used to park cars. Yeah. And I go there and I have this army guy with a hard hat, Enfield rifle, you know, the old World War II yeah. Enfield rifle yeah. with a bayonet and camouflage standing there. And I knew the Africans well, I spoke the language. Well, yeah. So, where are you going? I'm going to work. Yes. No, you cannot go. I said, why? Those are my orders. <laughs> you cannot go. Yeah. So I so turned around. I saw two white guys sitting there. Burly guys with crew cut. They had to be, you know, red in the face. So I talked to the Americans. I just said, hi. Yeah. I said, hi. He says, you speak English? I said, yeah, I do. He says, we are Americans. We come here to work in the embassy. Yeah. And uh, we are on a very important temporary duty. And we have to get to the embassy. So, so what can I do for you? He says, you, you speak this guy's lingo? I said, yeah, I do. <laughs> he said, can you tell him that we have to be become on very important duty? So I told the Africans, he said, I told you. My orders are not to let anyone through. So I told him. One of those Americans got cocky and he said, can you ask him if he can talk to his captain? <laughs> that did it to that guy. He got so mad. He says, I am my own captain. Now get out of here. And he pointed his bayonet at me. Put your hands up. In English or in Swahili? In Swahili. Swahili. <laughs> I was like this. Yeah. Waiting for the shot to go in any time. And then he called his other two guys. And they, they lined up behind me with their hands up, and they were trembling. They I were see. trembling. I see. And we were marched out of the compound. So, and he let, and then he went back. So I said, what do we do? What do we do? I said, where are you staying? We're staying in the Twig Hotel. Fine, go back there. But we don't know how to get there. So I'll fo follow me. I went, went up the main road, main shopping area. Broken glass everywhere. Everything was looted I by... See. You know, the Africans took up the opportunity to loot. Everything was looted. I, everything was I took him to his, to their hotel. I said, get to your room and don't get out. And then I walked back to my, to my room where yeah. I was staying. It was yeah. like on the second floor of the apartment. But Lionel was, who's from Kholi in Mafsa, and another guy called Lenny Fonseca. The three of us, we were rooming together. But then we said, what do we do now? I told him what happened. Hey, 
revolution, we don't know what might happen. Yeah. So fill every dekshi, every bucket, everything with water. Okay, water is very important. So fill everything we could, even bottles we filled with water. Then we said food. It was a Marathi lady running a shop called Friends Store across downstairs across from us. And speaking Marathi, and I, I could speak a little bit of Marathi that then coming from Belgium. So I went, I went, and you she was stayed in the back. You know, like the front was the shop, and the back they were yeah. living. So I went back, knocked on the door. She, she knew me, she let me in. So she said, what do you want? Take whatever you want. Got a carton, bread, tuna fish, sardine, man, anything I could find, you know, yeah. beans, anything. And I took it up to our room. Then I thought to myself, you know, we, we were listening to the radio. There was a incident in the African area where an Arab man was running a, a store. And if you know Swahili, half of Swahili is Hindi. I see. Okay? Like Rangi, Duka, Dawa, all these are, you know, yeah. Hindi words. I, took, I went with a friend one time, and Kitabu, Kalamu. Said, what, what, what language are you talking? Swahili. See, that's Hindi. <laughs> so, you know, that's what I'm trying to yeah. explain to you, that the relationship between Hindi and Swahili, because of the Indians, a lot of the words were very much a, a flag, with like, like a bandera, Portuguese. Portuguese. Um, table was Mesa. Mesa. Again, Portuguese. Because there's Portuguese influence there too. Yeah. So anyway, there was a there was a this thing there, and that African guy. This was like a week after the revolution in Zanzibar, and he was Arab, and he thought they would come after him. So he had his old Enfield rifle, and he was firing shots in the air. He said, "No one dare come near me. I will shoot anyone who comes close by." Okay. So word got around to the army guys, yeah. and I heard that the army guys on the radio had rushed there to that place to quieten, and I think they must have shot him dead or whatever, I don't know, but they, they ran there. And when I heard that, I said, you know, I know these Africans well. I bet that guy who was guarding the embassy, he must have gone with them too. So I went back to the friend's store and asked for another box bread and all kinds of stuff. And I went back to the embassy. Yeah. The same way that I'd gone in the morning. I looked around, no sign of a soldier. <laughs> Closely, I had to go up to the elevator, it was on the port floor. No sign of looking, you know, I could have been shot, but I, I went up there. And I got up to my to the fourth floor, I knocked on the door, and my, my boss says, was on the inside. Said, Who's that? I said, Vivian, sir. What the fucking hell are you doing here? Don't you know there's a revolution going on? I said, I know, I know, but I've come to work. How did you get here? Oh, I know this town very well. I, I just took the shortcuts and came through the back alleys. What are you I said, who's with you? I said, nobody. Move back so we can see you. He saw me carrying a box. What are you carrying there? I said, carrying some food, sir. I thought. In case I get stuck here, at least I'll have some food. That was the key. Open the door, let me in. I see. And then, you know, so what, should, what should I do? I was, I was, by that time, the adrenaline was too much. <laughs> I couldn't work. I couldn't go to my office. Okay. So, he went back to talk to the ambassador. And the ambassador, they had a talk for about 20 minutes. They came back. He came back outside, he said, he said, yeah. um, how did you get here? So I, I told you, I know this way, I know all the alleyways and all, and I came back and tried to avoid the main roads. He said, you didn't come across any troops? I said, they're out there chasing that Arab <laughs> guy who was shooting in the air. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to come to the embassy to work. And I thought I'd be safe. Actually, I thought I'd be safer in the embassy than I would be at home. Yeah. He said, "We want to ask you a favor. This is not an order. This yeah. is a favor. We have two very important people who are here. Carry on. Very important people. We need to bring them here. Okay. 
Well, I said, oh, I know those two guys. I met them <laughs> down there, and we, I told them about how we were kicked out of there by the yeah. army soldier. And uh, I told him to go on back to the hotel, Twig Hotel. He says, oh, so you know them? I said, yeah, I do. He says, can you bring them here? I said, sure. I was 23 years old. Yeah. Yeah, I was you know, caught Full of yourself. beans, full oh, of beans. Yeah, full of shit. So I go back to the, to the hotel, go end up to the floor and knock on the door. This guy said, we're not coming out. I said, please, please. I got a request from the American ambassador. He wants you and they need you desperately. They need you. They want me to guide you. Trust me, I'll show you how to get there yeah. without getting it. So very reluctantly they came. And this was all, you know, the church was close by, my school was close by, I knew the roads went through the church compound, through, the, through my school compound, came out. And then, then we had some, I was hiding them everywhere when I went in an alley, okay, stay here. I see. And I would go ahead and yeah. look, scout around to see if there any troops around. Yeah. I didn't see anybody, okay, come on. And I'd take them another 50 yards or so, do the same thing, yeah. hide them and look around, nobody. Actually, there was nobody there, no troops I at see. all. So I we see. got back and then we had to make a turn and go walk another say, half a mile go to the embassy. No, nobody there, no troops around. Mm. We got into the elevator, go up there. Got in. Hardly had we got in. Within five minutes, we heard the trucks coming back with the troops. I see. So we just got in there on time. We were stuck there for four days. I see. Okay? The American ambassador, my boss was second secretary, uh, and a telecommunications person, I remember her name, Donna Bells, and these two, and these two guys yeah. who I brought. And the only food that we had was what you had taken. What I had taken. Okay, so I was the hero for bringing <laughs> food, and that we had to have half a sandwich with tuna or something like for our dinner and for lunch. You know, we, we we spread it and then we are we are in the U.S. embassy and you are holding there for four days because okay, there's a revolution. Back to back to that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we got for, for four days. Yeah. Living on that ration, sandwich yeah. or whatever, yeah. and more water, and I remember uh, one time. Uh, this is a funny incident happened. I asked, what can I do? They said, can you answer the phone? I said, okay, I'll answer the phone. I don't know what to do. There were all these wires, you know, you put like yeah. this, like this, the old uh, exchange system. Yeah. And they got a call at one o'clock in the morning. This was the State Department, Washington, <laughs> D.C. They wanted to talk to Ambassador Leonard. And in those days, there was no security at all. I see. walk anywhere. I walked over to the ambassador's office, knocked on the door. And he said, who's that? I said, Vivian D'Souza, so I work in finance here. And, oh yeah, come on in. Yeah. I go into his room. He's on a, on a big, you know, overstuffed uh, sofa. Yeah. In his undershorts and singlet. Yeah. Lying there, but no shoes on. And he said, what's wrong? I said, I got a call from Washington, D.C. Yeah. From the State Department. I'm afraid I'll lose it trying to figure out those wires. He said, no problem, I'll come with you. And he came out of barefoot and he followed, I followed What him. was he doing? He was the ambassador. Yeah, but he was right. Sleeping, he was sleeping. 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 So he came there, he must have talked for about an hour. And they came up with a plan, okay? Yeah. Meantime, these two guys that I brought during the day, the British High Commission was like, not very far, less than about 50 meters away. Yeah. And it was like on the upper floor. And they were making this, you know, what they call sophomore, whatever signals yeah. that the Boy Scouts used right. to do, you know, like, Flags. like they were making those hand signals, like yeah. sailors or something made that day. Yeah. One second, just give me a sec. Sure. Hello. Is it though? Is it though? I'm slightly caught up. What time is your bus leaving? What time is your bus leaving? Okay, okay, okay. So as soon as I finish, I'll give you a call. I'll give you a call as soon as I finish. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Carry on. So, apparently they were, they, were connect, they were connecting to the British. Yeah. The British had warships offshore. Okay. But they had no way of communicating with them. And these two guys who I brought were yeah. very important to the Americans because they had just brought two-way radio, powerful two-way okay. radio. Okay. And they were the only people who had the ability to, to communicate with the British warships. 
I see. So the, Brit the British were giving them hand signals what to do and giving them the coordinates of where the army barracks was and all that stuff. And they were passing it on by radio to the British warships offshore. And then the next, on the fourth day in the morning, we all were friends by then. And this guy looking at the window and looking at his watches. Uh, hey, buddy, what's going on? He said, oh, 0600. Boom, boom. And sure enough, at 6 o'clock, we heard the shells hitting the barracks where the troops were. They ran for their lives. They dropped These their are British ships or? British ships. British. But they were getting, the, the, the orders were coming from the British through the American embassy to the ship because we were the only ones with radio equipment. I see. But they've corrected all that now. Yeah. They learned a lot yeah. from this experience. Yeah. And anyway, the next thing we heard was clack, 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 clack. British commandos came on helicopters and they routed the soldiers away and restored order to the country. So in, in a way, by bringing those people there to, who were able to communicate the British, I saved that situation for the country. Right, yeah? right. So anyway, then the country came back to normal. But I was told that there were some people in Tanzania who heard about what I had done. And I was on a watch list. In um, 1969, by the time, when I was a bachelor, 66, I got married, I had two children, and I was still working for the embassy, I was chief accountant. And one day, um, I was, suddenly I was called to the ambassador's office, and I was given a medal the Meritorious Honor Medal of the State Department, and a citation. Uh, we didn't tell the whole story because they were afraid to put it down on paper. Okay. The rationale for why I got the medal said, for sincere concern for resp responsibilities, devotion to the Foreign Service, the leadership of, of, America, of local employees, and a sustained performance beyond its prescribed duties. That's what the citation said. You still have it? Yeah. I have it. So. I see. So, and the medal also. That was my ticket to go to America, okay? I see. That was my ticket to go to America. Okay. Now, here I'm married, two kids. My boss, Earl Bellinger, was being transferred back to America. And he was after me. He said, even don't stay here. Come with me. I'm thinking, I don't have any money. I had two kids, I was spending money like crazy. I didn't, I really didn't have any savings. What do I do? You know, I, I'm thinking to myself, talking to Alva. So finally there was a party for him at the American ambassador's house. He was going back yeah. to America. Yeah. And um, Earl Bellinger, he, you know, was circulating a cocktail party like the situation. He came up to me, he said, Vivian, I'm coming, I'm asking you for the last time, are you coming or not? By the time I had a few drinks, yeah, I was I was a little a little bit was I turned to Alva. So what shall we do? She said, "Why not?" That's all he wanted to hear. Yeah, and he went circling. Next day, I go to him. I go to a work, and I had my own office. I had a big safe with lots of dollars and shillings, and I was a chief chief financial person for the embassy. Yeah, so. He was standing in my office and said, you're not coming back. You're not coming to your office. Right now, I want you to go get your all the credentials you have. And she had sixth grade and the sixth standard. <laughs> and photos of your all two children and you. Go to the, to the CID police and get, get a police clearance. Take your fingerprints and all that. Get a medical clearance. That was an X-ray because they wanted. They were concerned about TB, TB in those things. days. So we had X-rays. Getting the CID to the CID was no problem. They were all going guns. I see. There. Okay, so not a problem. Not going police. police okay. people. Went to the hospital, Aga Khan Hospital. I knew the doctors. No, no problem. Got immediately got a medical thing. And by the time I. Then I, but before going there, I said, let me go and get the photos, because I knew in those days there was no 
digital cameras yeah. or Polaroid. It or took anything. time. Everything was that thing like a bellows yeah. with a clock. And it was a Mr. Pereira, A.C. Gomez, and his son was the, was the photographer. And it was Mr. Pereira. Good man, nice man. A lot of Goan photographers You'll all over You'll need to unlock your iPhone yeah. first. Mm -hmm. We went to a small bound, turn on that light, you know, from the garage. I'll turn, I'll turn, don't worry, I'll turn, okay. I'll, I'll turn it, don't worry. So, he took his own time, you know, old time photographers, yeah. you know, like this and like that, and you know, put a little powder here, comb your hair. You are in a hurry. I'm in a hurry. So it, it took over two hours just to be with him. I see. So I, I went to him first before I went to the police and the medical and all the I knew it would take time. Yeah. So when he finished, I asked him, okay, Mr. Pereira, when can I get my pictures? Yeah. He says, he looked at it, he's saying, he says, give me 10 days. 10 days. I said, Mr. Pereira, I have to be back in the embassy today by 4 o'clock because I'm getting my visas to go to the green card to go to America. He said, impossible, impossible, my whole film. I said, I'll pay for your whole film. I knelt at him. I was crying. I see. Okay, I was so distraught at that, that moment. He, he felt sorry. He said, okay, come back before, before 4 o'clock. I see. And he did. He gave it to me. And I go back to the embassy. And we were waiting for him. My boss and the consular officer. And within half an hour, we had green cards for the four of us wow. to go to America. And, you know, later on I found that there was a list of about 2,000 people that had already signed up before us. They pushed everyone's name down and put us on the top and gave us top priority because I was an insider. Yeah. Then I had to go to America. I'm saying, what the hell I got to get money from? Saw my car, saw my pots and pans, saw my fridge, saw my cooker, I see. furniture, everything. And we, we barely had a lot of thousand dollars in hand. Wow. Then, I was in, a lot of Goans were being locked up at that time. Quite a few Goans were locked up, okay? So... In Tanzania, this is? Yeah, yeah. Including Manu Roderick, there was kind of a guy named Eves Lopez from, I don't know from where. I think he's from um, Majorda or somewhere. He, somebody heard him talk Portuguese and they locked him up. It, you know, it's a simple yeah. thing like that. So, when I, when I, uh, this see what they call it, um, I was scared. I didn't know what to do. So I told Aldo, I said, you know what? You never know with these guys. If we go to the airport, they might catch us there and put me in jail on some trumped up charge yeah. that I'm a spy for the Americans or something like that. So let's, we, were, we had been planning to take a vacation before I got this green card. You know, we were planning to take a vacation by train. There's a lake, big lake called Lake Victoria. Victoria, which touches and many countries. So yeah. I said, let's take the, let's buy a train ticket and go by train. Okay. Nobody will be watching the train station. So we got to the train station, the train, to Monza on the lake, caught a ship called, as the motor vessel Victoria overnight to a port in Kenya called Kisumu. Kisumu. And from there we took the train. Once I got out of Tanzania, God be praised, we are out. We're out of here. And from there we flew. I see. To yeah. where? To which part of US? Now, my boss, I asked him, now what do I do? Where do I go? I don't have qualification. He says, first thing, let me tell you. You are a good accountant, but you don't have a degree. Promise me that you will get your degree. I'll help you in any way I can, but promise me that you'll get your degree. I said, I promise. I don't know what I was promising, but I promise. And I said, how do I do it? He said, when there's a will, there's a way. There's night, you can go to college at night, there all kinds of ways in America to get a degree. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And he said, now, when you come to America, he said, you can go and work for my parents in Kansas. I looked at a map, I didn't know where Kansas was. Where are you going? I'm going to Washington, D.C. It's right near, near, near the coast. I said, can I come where you're going? He said, sure. And you come and you stay with us till you can get, you know, find a job yeah. and all that. 
And sure enough, he, he was there at the airport, he and his wife, and his wife's name was Michelle Bellinger. And they were at the airport, they put us up in their home. They, they'd just come back to America, but they, you know, but still, they put us up in a new home. And um, I went around looking for a job. After 15 days, before 15 days, I, and she took me around all over, you know, looking for whatever there was, a, you know, I'd apply for a yeah. job and they'd call me for an interview. And she would take me there. She was so helpful. I got a job in a small company called Taylor Freezer that sold ice cream machines and milkshake machines that they have in McDonald's like that. And the moment I got a job, very small pay, all that took in kids to babysit from the neighbors, we're staying in a flat. And there were three other Goan families there. Really? Yeah, who were already there. Who I, one of whom I knew, I worked with her in the embassy, in the embassy, her name was Divina Menezes. Her husband, Tarazio Menezes, he is from Lutoli, and she was from Soligon. And her sister, Lira, was also there with her husband, Raul Vegas. And there was one of the family, Joe Pinto, from Mopsa, I think. Joe and Nolinda Pinto. They were all good friends. So, we, you know, and the moment we got there, at least we were like, had somebody yes, close by. Yes, she's there, don't worry, she's not going anywhere. Who? I know, I was checking whether she was in my bedroom or... No, oh, she's here already. Okay. So, I went to college for, it took me six and a half years. Wow. To get my degree at night. Wow. And paying for my fees, I was scared as hell. You know, I, I didn't ask for help from anyone. I thought they would send me back if I yeah. tried to get help from the government okay. or anything. So I did it on my own. I did, I did every dirty job I see. possible. I, I, I cleaned toilets. I did every damn thing. Wow to make a little bit of money. I would go to my boss, they would give me one week's annual leave a year. And it was a Jewish one. I would, I would ask them, if I work that one week, can you give me the pay instead? And they were happy to give me. Wow. Yeah. So little by little, I collect whatever money we be. I paid my fees, bought my books, and I graduated. And then I went and did my CPA exam and became a certified, certified public, public accountant. accountant. I did very well in the in that company, but it's there was quite no, a tough exam, yeah. But there was no future. Okay. A small, you know, farm. Right. They even gave me a huge car to um, because one time I was leaving, they said, "No, no, you can't leave." I said, "Why?" I said, "My car is breaking down. I will give you a car." I they see. A big, huge eight eight V eight wow. engine car, big one from here to there, double the size of a uh, Innova. I see. Anyway, but I enjoyed it, and I said I had to leave. And my father always told me, work for government. You may not make much money, but when you retire, you'll get a pension. You get, you know, and some rules and regulations are there. In a private firm, they can fire you anytime. So I followed his advice, and I got into uh, the school system as an accountant. And in a few years, I was a, six years later, I was a director of facilities management I'm bragging now, but, I'm, uh, but it's true. I had 9,000 employees in my various divisions under me. So this is our U.S. state, one of the... Yes, yeah. Which Maryland. state? Maryland. Montgomery County, Maryland. I was director of facilities management. Wow. And all my... Uh, you know, I was on the same level as a high school principal. I see. High school principals and uh, deputy superintendents of schools. And they were all doctors. Okay? And because I gotta congratulate you and you became a no. PhD. But they were all PhDs. And one, one and I was the only one who didn't have a degree. But I was more on the technical side so it didn't matter. And Plus the CPA. One, the CPA is quite a prestigious and difficult exam in any case. It is, it is. It, it, it is, you know, they say it was even more difficult than the bar exam, I see. People, the lawyers. I was trying to be going to law as well, but anyway. But then I had to give my, my wife a chance to study. Yeah. And I put her through high school, and she went through three years of college. That was four years needed, but she, she came out working in the government, and she, she came up pretty high, too. I see. From six, six standard, not passed. 
I see. <laughs> so, she, but she did very well. The American system somehow gives you opportunity to continue. Oh yeah, and you're recognized for your work. Okay, you know we we come from hard hardship yeah. places. Yeah. And we worked hard. My colleagues, at one time I was in the budget office. I would be there till eight, nine o'clock, trying to finish my work for a day, never keep anything pending. And my colleagues, 4.30, they would start getting ready for 5 o'clock to play tennis. They didn't care about it. Okay. Okay. And I think at some point, somebody recognized that I worked hard. And I got promotion after promotion after promotion. And I became a department director in my own office. I had a car, you know, office car. So I, was, I did very well. So Vivian, if you think Goans do well outside Goa, what are the factors that help them to do well? That is if, they're, if they've got a work ethic. Yeah. Most important is the work ethic. And mm. we have the natural intelligence, okay? You know, we have the natural inten intelligence. We are also sociable. Honest. We are also sociable yeah. and adaptable, okay? We get along with anybody. We can get along with white people, black, anybody. So, you know, we were like naturally able to do this thing. People loved Gorns. This was in East Africa and other parts of the world as well? I'm talking about in America. I see. In America. You know, they, they, were, they liked Gorns very much. And, and wherever you go, again, the Gorns form an association. Okay? Wherever you go, the Gorns form an association. So. When you're in Dar es Salaam, you're a, a member of the club, you go to Nairobi, the club is waiting for you. You go to Kampala, Uganda, you go to a small town, and they say, well, there are two Goans, there's a club. You know, yeah. a, that was yeah. the a joke. In and if there are three Goans, it's probably two political parties. But That's right. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but, but to shift gears, uh, Vivian, uh, you encountered GoaNet in its early days. Tell us about that experience. Yeah, I was happy. You know, I had lived in, in India for nearly seven years. Yeah. And we used to come on holidays to go on. Mm -hmm. like, and yeah. no, hold your phone. I want to turn on that light. Which one? This one here. I turned on. Or no. This, no, this one, the bulb is burnt. Oh, the bulb is burnt. Okay. Yeah. Don't worry. So, I forget my train of thought now. Go on it and uh, encountering, encountering yeah. Goans. I, I was very happy because, you know, I, I'm, oh, I forgot to tell you, I was in, in, in Dar es Salaam at the time of independence. Yeah. I was assistant secretary of the Gordon, of the Gordon Institute. And we had about 800 family wow. members. Beautiful club, the best club in town. Uh, which is now the Dar Institute, yeah. DI? Which I, yeah. which I named. I anyway, see. What happened was, so the guy who I was assistant to, he had was transferred to Nairobi. Yeah. This before independence. And I had to fill in and then I was automatically put in that position. So I was a secretary of the club at the time of independence. And we had the best hall in town. Wow. And the government wanted to use our facility all the time. Yeah. And we couldn't say no. Yeah. Or come to the committee and you know, manage and say, Okay, we have to do it, we have to do it. Close the club down for membership. And the, the security guys would go with spears going through the whole, you know, wow. lawns and everything, make sure there are no bombs and whatnot. And they would have the big, big parties. And I was invited. Not because I was a big shot, yeah. but in case there was something wrong with lights or anything, they wanted somebody who knew the building. So I went into all the parties, met all the presidents. I mean, I met means I saw them. I didn't talk yeah. to them because I had nothing to talk to them about. And... Um, I knew them, I knew all of them. I mean, I met all of them, all the presidents, but not, I didn't talk much with them. So in the US, the Goans were scattered, I would presume. Then you encounter them online. How? Well, I was always on the computer for something or the other. I, I got on the computer, I got online somewhere in 1999 or 2000. Okay. When I got online. And you were there. Yeah, yeah. And you were putting up pictures of Goa, which of course made me very happy to see pictures of sunlight in Saligao and God knows what else. And I, in fact, I wanted to bring you some stuff, and you said, no, 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 don't bring. So Fisherman Nerul and all that. I think that was on Yuli's website. So for those who don't know, these 
three initiatives started at the same time. Malin Menezes, Ulysses Menezes, and Hamid Karnero. Yeah, yeah, Ulysses Hamid Menezes, right. Yeah. Ulysses Menezes. He's still around, by the way. All three are still around. Uh, where's Malin? Malin is working for AI. He is or was, you know, this uh, American firm called AI, which is... Uh, Artificial intelligence? No, no, no. It's some kind of hardware. They, they make the chips. They design chips or something of that sort. High-tech stuff. Smart guy. Yeah. He's yeah. in Texas. He was in Texas. Yeah. yeah I met him one time. Okay. Um, all in many, yeah. So you came online. You came online, and and you you brought in a whole lot of the Africa experience with you. Would that be right? Yeah. Yeah. I was sector in a club. Okay. Yeah. And in those days, yeah, we we were we had a great club. Okay. We uh, Rene and all of them. Of course, we were together. Yeah. Okay, from young. So we started a going, I would call it, marriage was his bachelor's occasion. Okay. Back in 1963. Okay. And it's still running now. There are a few goans there, but they have it marriage versus bachelor's. What, what's that? Football? No. Football, hockey, cricket. Wow. Um, tug of war even. And okay. then a big dance, you know, with the... Um, and ladies and gents and badminton. Okay. And ladies and gents. And then we'd have a big... Uh, dance with uh, you know catered dinner and everything. Can the club culture be taken to other parts of the Goan world? If not, why been, not? Has been. But with limited success. See, in Britain, they've been struggling. Now, Canada Britain, set up. I think there's too much of politics in Britain. Politics, but also probably, we have to be to be fair. Is it the geographical spread? The fact that people are not living in a small area like they were in Dar right. or Nairobi or even Dobitalau. You know, where, where they were compact communities. Right. We were, we were pretty compact. We could walk yeah. to the club. I didn't have a car. We used to walk to the club. And, and they were brought to Goa also. Like you have Moira, you have Saligao, you have Aldona. So these, as I and see them... in Pune, there's a Pune Institute. Yes, yes, PGI. Yeah. All these, most of them are 100, 110 years old. They yeah. seem to have been going on and being built in the 19, early 1900s. Right. But after that, sustaining them... See, a village like Thimi, I was shocked and surprised, pleasantly, has four clubs. But today, in the 21st century, it's hard to keep them active, hard to keep them alive. You know, many are facing this problem. And I think it has something to do with the scattered nature of, of the community, the fact that, I don't know what. No, and you know, one thing, that, now I was involved in forming the Goan Association in, in US, I mean in Washington, D.C. Okay. also. Okay. One of the founding members, or whatever you call it. And we started. We started with having celebrating the feast of Saint Francis Xavier. Okay. On the third of December. Which year? Uh, this was. Let's see, my brother Philip. You know, must be knowing my brother Philip. I've heard the name. He married to Rowena, who's a daughter of that Colonel Edwin. Okay. The Yeah. 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 Uh, he's my younger brother by nine and a half years. Okay. Uh, he was he was there, so he came in seventy six. So it's around 1977, 78, We started a Early. association. Yeah. yeah, and it's going on. I see. When we were there, there were about a dozen Goan families. I now see. there must be about two hundred, at least two hundred Goan. This families. is in Washington. Washington. Or oh, my brother. No, no. This uh, association is based in. Yeah, yeah. Washington. Yeah. But then, unlike in East Africa. They may not have a physical presence, no? We didn't have a club. Yeah. Now, I think in um, Canada, I think they may have They have. They just, no, started. No, just started. London, they tried. They set it up. But there was that fire, which is totally no, unexplained. It, it used to be, generally, the, it was the East Africans who were the ones who started this club. They had happy club memories. Yeah. But in, in uh, but then there was a divide in Canada between the Can Orient yeah. and the Goan. Can Orient was more Karachi based. Yeah, yeah. See, that's always bound to happen, and I don't think we need to be apologetic about that. We've had much bigger challenges, caste, class. Geography is okay. I mean, geography is fine. Like you have codes. I think the caste thing. I think I think uh, is not there so much now. Mm. Yeah, I don't. Maybe there are among few families. I don't know. But we 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 get we take we take umbrage about caste, but I think of all the Indian communities. We are probably the least castiest. Of course, there's a long way to go, but still, we, we, yeah. we, 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 you know. 
we are getting there hopefully. I, I, I remember going to some occasion here and one guy came from Canada and he was something to do with that. What that guy was a police guy in Beijing. Alan and yes, Alan Alan Desa. Alan Desa. It was his brother or something. And his brother came from us from Canada. And we were sitting around and he started telling me he's come looking for brides for his sons. Okay. And he said they're Brahmin. <laughs> so I got a shock. <laughs> yeah. In this day and age he's coming from Canada. What's he talking about? It does it does surface in times of marriage particularly, but of course people today are quite practical and they are more concerned about earning potential and education. Well, I mean and I know. You know, I yeah. I'll tell you, I had like a Rene S E I don't know who's what caste yeah. or what. I they were my friends. Yeah. You know, we never if you grow up in the diaspora, it's less of a marker and less of an important thing. If you then, grow up in parts of Goa or full of Goa, then sooner or later you get to know it. Like, you know, even we came back and uh, for a good many years we didn't know what was this thing all about. I, I, when I was very young, I remember going to the club. I was eight, nine years old. And one guy, he was a Cordero, and he asked me, what caste are you? <laughs> and I didn't know what he was talking about. Yeah. So I'm Brahmin. He was, I, I think he was from Saligam. Okay. And I went home and asked my parents. And my parents were upset. They said, who told you that? Who asked you this? I see. So somebody, that guy was asking me. I think, Don't it, talk about it. It can start at a very early age at times. Then. No, but I, you know, my parents never talked about yeah. it. Yeah. So it, it also depends on the family, yeah. you know? How, how it goes around. Whether you grew up with grandparents, uh, previous generation or migration I found has been quite a leveler. Though everyone makes a big thing about caste in the Goan clubs in, 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 in East Africa. In East Africa I, there were two big clubs, uh, mm. the Goan Institute and yeah. the Goan Gymkhana. Yeah. And they almost become one now. You know, a few of them. Yeah. So they had to... But, but I always wonder, I have mixed feelings on this point because you're not sure whether you're overstating the case or whether you're playing it down. You know, no, it depends, I guess. I, I, you know, I came across a lot of people who are very, very, very costless. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I, never, I never said anything. I, I said, I don't know what I am. I'm a Goan Catholic. Yeah. But I, I came across a lot of people. And, they, and, and I, both ways, okay? Mm. I would have people who would tell me, oh, that guy, he's a Brahmin. Be careful of him. Yeah, be careful of him. You know, we were organizing that big dance at, uh, at the Riviera in Mopsa. At what? At what? 2007. Uh -huh. Not Mopsa, in Panjim. We had a big, you know, uh, go on reunion kind okay. of a dance, big okay. dance. It was very successful. 1987 or no, 2000, 2007. 2007. And we had to go to that Falero guy. Okay. Edward Falero. Edward Falero. NRI Commissioner. And, uh, and there was a guy from Kalangur. And after telling me, you know, that guy is Brahmin. <laughs> I didn't know what was what or what. You know. Yeah, sometimes it's a suspicion more than anything else. People don't trust each other. So there is, a, you know, there is a gap and uh, it, but, but it can I, work both ways. I don't hear, you know, in this village, I don't hear about it at all. Mm. I, do, I never mm. hear, I honestly I've never heard about in it. In fact, in today's day and age, it comes up at times of marriage and those kind of things, you know, which are seen as still crucial, endogamy, you want to marry within your own kind. But otherwise, I think, you know, as the number of Catholics go down, the which brings us to a related point, uh, Viv, do you see it? what do you see as the future of yeah, so Goans totally and Goan migration? Back to America, you know what, there were about yeah. five people, small gathering, yeah. most, mostly yeah. Goans. Yeah. Uh, my daughter wanted them to, they, they wanted to meet us. They heard that we were coming from Goa and most of them wanted to be curious. What are we doing in Goa? And what yeah. So they, a lot of them had, had questions. And I, t I told them, look, I didn't come here with any answers, notion, pre -notion, pre you know, preconceived notions in Goa. Yeah. Okay. I wanted, I wanted a quiet life and I wanted to be, I wanted to help. Whatever money I had, I, I've done a lot. I, I don't want to brag about it, but I've done. I built house, a house for one person, I, two or three people. I repaired their whole home for them. Uh, and I've sent some kids to college, to school, buy books. 
lots of the medicines. I've done it quietly. I won't never mention their names. I told them, don't ever mention my name. And I've helped the church. And, the ch and, and my this thing is very low-key. I, I keep on helping, hmm. you know, but at a very low-key level. I don't, want, I don't want any publicity at all. Um, unlike my friend Rene, who wants publicity for every damn thing. Rene, Rene is not a bad guy. He's yeah. just, you know... He has his good points as well. I mean, he's a, he's a pusher. He's a go-getter, but... Yeah, but you know, in my class, in yeah. SSC class, I stood sixth out of 90 students. Wow. And Rene must have been about 89 or 80 or something. Okay. He was right at the bottom. Okay. I, I, I tell him all the time, nothing up here, man. Nothing up here. I, I tell him because you know, he's my friend. Yeah. But he's got a heart of gold. Yeah. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't mean anything. Bad, yeah. But he just, he likes to get, and his wife pumps him up. His, his wife is from Majorda. She's part of the family of the Norman Godino School okay. in Kapala. Big, yeah. Godino's, Big school, yeah. yeah she's, Norman Godino. She's somehow related to okay. that. And, um, she, but you know, I, I, I don't know what's going to happen. I look at my own children. I built this house and we built rooms, you know, thing for this, this child and that child and that child. And I don't know if they'll ever come back here. In fact, my son came about seven years ago, mm. and he's married to a white girl. And he said to me, Dad, you know, this may be my last visit to Goa. I said, why? He said, well, you know, there's so much in the world to see, and all the other places we want to go to. He'd been three, three or four times, he'd been here before that. I said, okay, that's up, up to you. Mm. Then he had his 10-year-old son piped up. No way! He's responding to his dad. I am coming back to go. I am coming to see my papa and nana. And my son, his face fell. He was so embarrassed that he doesn't want to. He said he's not coming back, but his ten-year-old son says he wants to come back to go. So I don't know whether the sentiment filtered down to the children or not. I don't know. I know, I know how you feel, and I, I, I can understand the uncertainty there. But uh, just to, to maybe share two of my stories. When we came back to Goa in the 60s from Brazil, of all places, uh, we thought we were coming home, and we reached a place which we couldn't understand at all. And till today, I always say that a lot of my work, what I'm doing, collecting books, uh, reading, writing, doing a few videos, audio recording is also part of my endeavor to understand the uh, broader picture of what Goa is. And today, today to some extent, I do understand it. So it's, it's, that's that. Secondly, you know, sometimes while we can see the negatives and the challenges, like, you know, people making Portuguese passports on a mass scale is one reality. Uh, you know, the positives, when they come, they come without warning. So, for example, the birth of the, of the cyberspace in the mid-90s and this full role that uh, Goans played in taking... This tiny part of, of South Asia onto cyberspace at a very early age, very early stage compared to all Indian states, which really connected, you know, I would like to believe it connected uh, us hugely in that sense. Oh, so, yeah. so, you know, things happen, good and bad. There are challenges. My, my vision is one. As long as people can keep a toe in Goa, they don't even have to keep a foot, just a toe. And we make it easy for them to connect and, and they have this interest in connecting, which is not happening at the moment. It's not easy to connect with Goa. Goa has so many problems anyway. Yeah. Yes. Well, you know, but which country doesn't have any problems? Yeah. I lived in America for 32 years, okay? Mm. I lived in America for 32 years. And, you know, I, I tell people, look, um, everything, everything that, that glitters is not gold. Yeah. Okay? I said, you may have some things here, but there's a lot of stress. There's a lot of stress. Look at the shootings going on in America. I don't know when I'll be in a place, in a bank or in a, in a shopping center or something and get somebody shot just because... Because, hmm. because uh, you're you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just... Yeah. It's something that's weighing on my mind all the time. Yeah. And this time when I went, you know, I had to go to the bank and I was afraid to go to the banks or anything that somebody would come and yeah. shoot somebody. No, my only point was this, Viv. What I was saying, I agree with you fully. What I was saying is that... See, one would expect that Goa would recognize the role that its diaspora can play, but it has not happened and it's not happening. You know, it's not happening. 
because uh, there's a divide between Catholics and Hindus. The mm. major, who are the out there? Mostly Catholics. Yeah. Okay. Mostly Catholics. Mm. Not, not, there are Hindus also. Quite a Increasingly few. Increasingly growing, growing now. Yeah. yeah. In fact, but there was a there was a Goan. I was surprised. I'm in Chicago, and it was all Hindus. Yeah. And I wanted to go, and I said, you know, I'll be a lot of place here. I better not go. Yeah. The the associations are still uh, separate, split. Separate. Yeah, separate. Um, and, and you know, when, when, when we were in the, in the Washington area, we had one Shirodka, we had one Shirodka, mm. we had one Telang. Yeah. Down there, you know, in our group. In your group. They, they would group. come, you know, they would be there, they would yeah. be happy to be there. But I think we have not been able to cross the, to bridge that gap as yet. Yeah. But last thing, last, this is positively the last, Shenzi. Where does that come from? Your email address used to be Shenzi. Sukurkar and Shenzi also. What is Shenzi? Where does Shenzi it come from? Means piso. In Swahili. Badmas? Badmash? Badmas. Where did you pick it up from? Tanzania. Okay. People call you that? Some in school or something? No, no, no. 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 I just sort of self depreciation. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Just to make fun. Yeah. Everyone, everyone, some, somebody one time wrote to me, do you know what it means? It's a terrible word. I said, okay, I know, I know. I'm just making fun of myself. So, what were your email addresses all along? You started with Shenzi. Yeah. And then when I came here, I couldn't get Shenzi again, so I had to make it Shenzi 62. Okay. So that's the year that I established it here. Okay. Because, you know, Shenzi, I guess it is in the memory of the yeah. whatever, the big picture. So I couldn't get Shenzi. And then after that, I had to change it. I changed it to Sukorokar. Sukorokar. Yeah. Lovely and village, lovely village, very village like. Let me tell nice you about place. this place. Okay. My, I was looking for, I wanted to come to Goa. All this, I love Goa. I love Goa with a passion. I didn't come here because it's cheaper or anything of that sort. Yeah. Okay. It I was a love, choice. I love Goa because as a kid, I was eight years old. This very village is mine. Okay. Yeah. I'm I'm a gaunkar. Mina. Of Sukor. Of Sukur. the of the Kamida de Cerula. Yeah. You know what Cerula is? Head. Pardon? Head village. No, no. Cerula was the village. Yeah. That comprised Salvador de Moon. Canyon de France, uh, Sukor, yeah, and some, some, and Sukor, yeah, and a small half. portion of uh, Pomburpa. Three and a half villages, as they call yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So it's called Serola, and we have like Gaunkas. It, it's it sort of like tells me I'm tied down to this soil. Yeah. Okay, that's the only thing that I liked about it was yeah. I'm recognized as a descendant of this village. As I was eight years old, my father came after the Second World War. Uh, he came, you know, he, he, took, he couldn't come during the war because they were ship yeah. they were bombing the ships. Including the Marcials and all that. Wilfred Marcial's dad. Um, Wilfred Marcial's dad. Marcial, Marcial. Marcial, yeah. yeah. He, he, used to, he writes to me. Yeah. Uh, he, he, write, he writes to me still. Yeah, from Salvador the Yeah. Uh, I never met the guy, but I just, I see. Uh, on, on uh, this thing. And even Eric Pinto, I never met him. Yeah. But uh, anyway, so, you know, the, 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 I mean, so we couldn't come. 1940 was the last my father came to India. And then from 40 to 46, he okay. couldn't come. Okay. In 47, he was given all his long leave of long okay. time, about seven and a half months. I see. Accumulated overseas leave. Okay. And so we came by ship. Wow. And uh, I remember coming to Margao, Mar 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 Margao. Yeah. And when the ship was coming to the harbor, I was, I was not yet eight years, seven years. I was looking, what's going on here? All these ships, master ships. I see. In the harbor. I see. All the German ships had been scuttled. In I Mar see. Don't you, you don't know about it? Yeah, 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 I know that story. But I the see. ruins were still there? Not now. That time in 46? 47. 47, they were still there? In April 47, they were still there. I see. And, you know, I was, I, and I didn't know. What a seven-year-old now. Yeah. You know? And I remember the ship, you know, had a pilot taking it round okay. and round okay. the ship okay. to okay. bring us and my grandfather. And then I was stuck here for seven months. I couldn't go to school or anything. I used to follow my grandfather, go over to the fields to plant rice. I see. Okay. 
uh, and I even I remember transplanting rice in wow. the field in, behind our house down there. Yeah. And um, I used to go up on the hills to get firewood. We used to, used to make a small bottle of me, you know. Okay. To carry on my head. Yeah. We used to go and bring mangoes and jackfruit and cashews and carry on my head. He used to give me a smaller load to carry. Yeah. But I was so enamored of Goa. Wow. And you know the. I saw the I saw the old time uh, Sanjiang when they were coming around the wells and jumping in and you know in the wells. I mean I saw th that those things stuck with me. That was our culture, you know. It still is. It still is, but in in changing ways. But in changing but, ways. Not the same. I mean they yeah. don't jump in the wells anymore so much. Hmm. I mean they might make an artificial well or something yeah. like that to just to give that. Yeah, that time it was much more intense and oh, it did it in more. every every part of the village, house to house. house. Community building. Today we build communities online. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's a wonderful uh, exchange, uh, Vivian. So nice. No, to that's what that's what you know. Those memories brought me yeah. back to Goa. At the moment, you are what age? I'm. I'll be. I'm, I'm turned 84 last June. Okay. 84. May you have many more years and I don't know. lot more memories. No, 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 no. Keep it. Keep it. Keep. Keep. My doctor, Doctor Chandrasekhar, told me. He said, "No more flying." Okay. And you're already 80, you know, you're 80, 50. Uh, so you had a good life. Now, the rest of your life, take it easy. Don't exert yourself. Just play it cool. All the very best. So that's what I'm doing. But I, but I, I you know. I think you'll keep wife, busy. My wife loves Goa more than I do. I see. And she was not, she, she lost her mother when she was about four years old. Okay. Died in Bombay. Okay. Her, her father was from Polony, her mother was from from Berna. Okay. And he had brought his five kids with him by ship. Yeah. And then when he was going back, she delivered in Bombay. And a, a few days after she delivered, she died of typhoid. Oh. And he took his six kids and went back to Africa. Oh, God. And raised them. And he died when, before I met, I never met him. I see. He died. So, but, uh, she loved Goa, and you know, she said, when, even when we went uh, this last time, she didn't want to come. I said, see. I need you to sign the bank papers, okay. please. I mean, this is the last time, we won't come again. <laughs> and she, she was wanting to come back. <laughs> she loved Interesting Goa. She story. She speak Konkani. Interesting story. But she loves Goa. She loves she said, Yeah. So these are my golden. And here we sit here. Let me tell you, I bought this land. Yeah. My sister Marlene was the one who told me it was available. Okay. And this family, uh, their children had all gone to, uh, this was their ancestral home. This okay, okay. was here. The house was down there. I see. In and ruins, in ruins. Go on. In ruins. Yeah, in ruins. And th they were staying in, it was not in ruins. I okay. think they broke it down after they left here. Because okay. they were staying here. They got scared because everyone else had left and gone that side. I see. Okay. And so they decided to build a smaller house next to my sister's house. And um, they wanted to sell this, and they sold it, ten thousand square meters, for thirty rupees a square meter. Wow! Including rice fields. Yeah. In the back, you know, there's a tall end here. They yeah. call it tall end. Yeah. Pond. I don't know if you know about, it, but it, it used to be a rice field. Okay. In the, they used to grow the what do you call it, wine gone, wine yeah. whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Only one one, one crop. crop. But the soil is so rich. I see. Because all the water from the hills run off from run yeah. off here. And then it becomes like a lake. I've taken a picture one time, and I swear you would think you were in Europe somewhere. I see. The mountains were reflected wow. in the water. But now there's all mangroves coming up okay. in the field. Okay. So it's not the same anymore. But, um, and thinking about those old people when they built it, there was a, like a slope going down there. They, they built a bond. I see. Closed it off, okay? And the water would collect here from all the sea would collect here, and then there's a there's a spillway towards the back, where the water slowly goes into the wall. Yeah. And I'm thinking these guys had the engineering skills way back four five hundred years ago when they when they did this, they had, they thought of all that. True. You know, so that the the walls wouldn't be yeah overflowing. Amazing. The water would collect here, and then go down. Amazing uh, traditional sciences. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing when I when I think of it, and I and I I, I, owed, I owned part of it. 
I, I sold it quickly when I found out that I'm not supposed to okay. have plantation property being okay. a foreigner. Yeah, yeah. So I, I gave it to some, my, one of my employees. I didn't want it. I didn't All the best. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for coming. My pleasure. And congratulations on your getting your PhD. No, no, no.